There Will Be Blood, Paul Thomas Anderson's epic character study of the anti-heroic oil baron Daniel Plainview, I drink your milkshake, offers a stupendous, visceral experience that is cloaked with the sound of silence, along with occasional demonic howls and explosions. The character design, I've abandoned my child! I've abandoned my boy! Imagery and plot structure derive their influence from prominent classics like Greed, Citizen Kane, the Treasure of the Sierra Madre, and even The Godfather. But despite all of those visual influences, There Will Be Blood remains unique both in its design and execution, and the film's undisputed credibility is all but engraved in its formidable, almost wordless 14-minute opening sequence. In this video, we will briefly analyze the opening sequence of the film, which perfectly reveals all we need to know about our protagonist at that stage of his life, along with his domain, with the help of a few sighs, a piece of unsettling music, and a void of silence. As the title is plastered on the screen, there's an unbearable silence, which is gradually overridden by a dissonant chord. As the intensity of the sound reaches a threshold point, we see a wide sweeping shot of America's famous Rocky Mountain range. Then, as the unnerving music dies down, we cut to a dark cave, where a lone man is hitting at the stone walls with a pickaxe as little sparks fly with each strike on the cavern. As darkness surrounds the landscape, he climbs out of the menacing, physically dangerous hole in the ground to sit huddled before a fire, sipping tea. Now we get the full view of the bearded and untidy man sitting amidst howling wind with the disregarding look of a primitive man. Later, he chisels at the rocks of his silver mine to find a glinting silver stone. But a few minutes later, he gets suckered into the deep ground as he accidentally falls in, breaking his leg. When he comes to consciousness with a few panicked breaths, he immediately picks up one of the loosened rocks, recognizing the fact that Mother Earth has provided him with one of her wealthy infants. As the man slowly climbs out with his twisted leg, rather than getting proper medical attention, we see him lying at an assay office, waiting for his ore to be processed. This shows the man's unbelievable fixation, that he's not just another common prospector with the half-witted idea of attaining the American dream. Eventually, as we get to know this man's name, Daniel Plainview, he appears more as an authorized figure and less as a primitive man. The year is now 1902, and the well-groomed Plainview and his expanding team of miners work tirelessly. He has also become more advanced in his approach to mining. This sketch is brought to reality, and the small crew accidentally strikes oil instead of silver. ecstasy of coming across this viscous liquid is pretty evident on Plainview's face. But what we hear is the same ominous music, 
hinting at how the character's relentless pursuit is going to pay the path to greed and ruthlessness. Meanwhile, a miner marks the forehead of his infant, sitting near the little pond of oil. Moments later, a piece of mining equipment breaks and falls down the hole, instantly killing the infant's father. While Daniel, who is working in the same pit, is unharmed. This moment enhances two vital elements that will drive Daniel Plainview's journey as an oil baron, his disregard for his own safety and the manner in which he treats his workers as sentient tools. How he responds to such a dangerous situation, in turn, reveals just how obsessed he is and will become with the success of his business. What are you looking so miserable about? There's a whole ocean of oil under our feet. No one can get at it except for me. With placid emotion, he looks at the crying child in the basket. His ignorance in looking after a child could be obviously understood by the way he gives the baby a taste of alcohol. However, there is a hint of love by the manner in which he is able to soothe the little one. Then we see the last brilliant shot of the opening segment, where Daniel is sitting next to the baby on a train. In what happens to be the film's most tender moment, the baby touches Daniel's face, showing him what unadulterated love is. Or perhaps it's this moment that brings Daniel the thought of how family is important to gain trust in business. As this image lingers, we hear Daniel Plainview speaking in the year 1912, which finally confirms that an order has been established. An active speech fully inhabits the visual space, previously occupied by abstract, dreamlike imagery. Ladies and gentlemen, if I say I'm an oil man, you will agree. Now you have a great chance here. But bear in mind you can lose it all if you're not careful. These opening sequences of There Will Be Blood cleverly ingrain the nature of the story, as well as that of its primary character. The engrossing nature of Paul Thomas Anderson's introductory sequence would not have appeared quite as prodigious without the organic manner in which Daniel Day-Lewis embodies a man who sees the worst in people. There Will Be Blood remains a showcase of a filmmaker's admirable ability to set in motion narrative and character development without any dialogue at all.